August 6th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights Tonight, Kineticon 2009, where we ran every panel in Panel 5. Let's do this. So, about five seconds ago, we recorded the third take of the opening to this episode, and I failed at it. Yeah, because uh, previously we got nothing. Previously, I also failed at it, and before that, we combinedly failed at it. There's, it was, there's nothing going on. I, I'm not saving it for an outtake. It's just gone. I deleted it. I destroyed information. It's, uh, it's a convention recovery week. We're going to work. We're coming home. We're going to bed. There is nothing well, I got all. one thing, though, because, you know, my car has been busted for, like, ever. So I was, like, biking to work and staying at Emily's apartment because it's closer to the train and I could walk down there. Because it's, like, two and a half miles to the train station from here. And, you know, my bike got stolen. So I'm walking back from the train station yesterday. And it takes, like, you know, 20 minutes to walk home. And along the way... I thought you rollerbladed. Well, no, yesterday I walked. Today uh-huh. I rollerbladed. Uh-huh. So yesterday, you know, I'm walking and... All I can think in my head, you know, I see a kid riding by on his bike, and I just hear, it's the Pee Wee's Big Adventure theme just in my head. I'm like scoping every kid out, like, is that my bike? Is that my bike? Where's my bike? Son of a bitch, my bike's somewhere. But, uh, you know, no bike, no car. I had to resort to the rollerblades. Let me tell you once again, New York as a state hates rollerblades. It just hates everything about him. All the sidewalks suck. There's nowhere to rollerblade. There's like gravel and grit and everything all over the roads. There's these hills everywhere. Rollerblading at night in the dark in New York is possibly the worst thing in the world. It's, uh, you know, it's not one of those new places where everything is smooth and flat. This yeah, is like old... Seattle, you could rollerblade like anywhere. The sidewalk is like perfectly straight. And you go to that cool park the, that was all parkour-ish that we oh, were in. yeah. Man, but you know what's cool? I learned more right and more. It's right attached to the convention center. I there. learned about freestyle walking and freestyle running, which is like baby parkour. But it's basically just walk quickly on weird stuff and in weird places and... More and more, I, I want the culture of Seattle to appear here because I think parkour is awesome. And here we don't even have punk skate kids. The skate park has been abandoned for two years. It's just been this flat, empty, like fenced off area. Really? Because I saw some skater kids uh, sitting at the old high school like yeah, the other day. There's skater kids about, but there's nowhere to skateboard except the skate park. But the skate park is just flat now. Really? I don't know if Beacon ran out of money or what, but there's no more skate park as far as I can see. That's weird. It's there. The like, yeah, if you have there. a ramp, all you need is a swimming pool without any water in it, really. Yeah, That's... you need some bumps. You need like a bump or two and a rail and a half pipe. It's, it's, they're not expensive. <laughs> they're real cheap. So I don't know. Maybe I don't know why Beacon doesn't have them there anymore, but I feel like the thing you can do to make any town in the world better is give punk kids a place to hang out and hurt themselves. That's not drugs. Yeah, because if there's nothing to do, it's either Mario or drugs. Yep. If kids are out, the kids don't do drugs outside. They do drugs inside. So if you make outside fun. They won't do drugs because they want to go wee. So give them things to go wee with. If you're a kid and you want to go, go wee, wee, but you ain't got drugs yet. All right. So anyway, uh, you know it's Thursday. It's always the fast and loose geek nights, and uh, we're doing a convention review, which. It's interesting, and I came up with this idea completely in a self-serving way. Because, hey, it's hard to come up with Thursday show ideas. Thursday well, is the well, day. Well, we should qualify that. It's easy to come up with Thursday show ideas, but here's how the uh, Thursday afternoon conversation goes. Hey, Scott, let's do a show on blah. I'm not feeling it. How about a show on blah? Well, I got like five minutes of shit to say about that. What do you want to do? I don't know. <laughs> There's nothing to do Thursday shows And then you're on. like, how about we do a show on... Fire. Like, <laughs> like, we already did part one of that. There's nothing to do Thursday shows on. Except everything. Except nothing. Everything. So, uh, anything. Rim just doesn't want to admit that there are no Thursday shows left. I got plenty of ideas. And so we made the book club just to fill up Thursday shows. Yeah, so how far so, are you on uh, Steppenwolf there, Scott? I'm reading comic books instead. Ah, how yeah. far are you on uh, any comic book? Com- I'm about halfway through Contract with God. I just read <laughs> Cran Shin Chan. I just, re- I just finished reading Orion and Black Magic. Yeah, good choice. Yes, <laughs> yeah, great winners. stuff. Uh, anyway, and uh, so we're like, hey, you know, Kineticon isn't an anime con or a gaming con. It's an everything con. Everything Kineticon, geeky. Kineticon in Hartford, Connecticut, really, like, 
it says stand- right on the cover of the book, everything, everything but the kitchen sink. The con stands out for me. And every year, it's weird how I'll, I would always be kind of unexcited about Kinetic Con you know, before it. I'd always think of it as this con like, yeah, that's like the con we go to Well, after all the other cons. And this is where we test all our stuff. But then I'm at Kinetic Con, and like, suddenly I realize, oh, man, this is the con where... Everything cool happens because there's no restriction of just being about anime. Daryl Surratt can't complain about Kineticon. No, he can't. It's an everything con. Everything geeky is allowed at Kineticon. They even have, like, belly dancing and shit. It's good belly dancing, too. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. I, th- I so, wonder if it's the same person who was at the, uh, it, the other con. I don't know if they were at another con, but it's the same person who's been at Kineticon multiple because times. Because one thing I've seen, you know, I used to go to a lot of, like, Rochester area sci-fi fantasy cons. And there was a lot of belly dancing at those cons, and it was the same person doing it everywhere. Yep, so doing our uh, Thursday show as the Kineticon is like this great move because we kill off Thursday show, we can do the Kineticon show while it's still fresh in our mind. More importantly, I want more people to go to Kineticon because it's a pretty big con. There's like six, 7,000 people, but... I think a lot more people would go if they realized that it's not an anime con. Yeah, the thing is, it felt like less people than last year. I don't know what the actual number is. The numbers is. were comparable. It was a little over 6,000. Comparable. Comparable. They were they were able to be compared, so comparable. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, that's what we're going to do today. But uh, do you want to do news and things of the day, or do you want to skip it, or what? I got some things to talk about. All right. Th- this is real interesting. You know, I have a vested interest in New York City in general. You know, I work there. I'd like to live there someday. It kind of, it is the center of the world. It is the center of the economy. It is the center of basically my entire professional career in life. And it has some problems in that it already has like this gigantic mass transit system. You go to Seattle, you go to DC, and they have like these baby mass transit systems. Like, I, I, it was our friend Adam who pointed this out to me. You know, he, he was in New York. He had a friend who was in New York, and he moved to DC, and he had this friend visit him in DC, and the guy was like, yeah, how do I get to your house? He's like, take the red line, like, four stops. He's like, what do you mean red line? That's complicated. Uh, how am I going to figure it out when I get there? And the guy's like, you lived in New York City, right? Yeah. Well, imagine if the New York City subway map was drawn in crayon for fourth graders. That's the metro. <laughs> So New York already has like this giant transit system, but it's already at capacity. Like, I can't get on the six train. It's just too crowded. And people in New York State and New York City don't want to spend more money on it because no one likes to pay taxes. And they're trying to figure out ways to make the transit system better. And they're making all these improvements. But Mayor Bloomberg, to his credit, just put out there this one of those crazy ideas where you hear it and you think, that's crazy. But then you think about it and you realize, that's just crazy enough to work. Hmm? Let me tell you a tale of the M42 bus. Oh, God. It's the only way to get across town in Midtown. If you want to go across blocks, there's basically no way. You can walk, take the shuttle well, to Times Square. Yeah. Basically, Manhattan is very tall, but it's not very wide. I mean, it only takes, you know, so many minutes to walk all the way across from the east to the west. But it right? still, it takes a while. You know, I'm it trying takes, to get... It does take a while, but it doesn't take that long. It takes, know? like, you know, 20 minutes to walk across, that's depending about, on where you are. That's about right. If you just keep walking and don't stop and dilly-dally or get anything in your way or whatever. But so. if I have to go to, like, the Javits for, you know, an anime con or a comic con or something... It's pretty much always going to be raining. Yeah, it sucks. So I ended up taking a cab. It's miserable. But there's basically no way to get across town. And they're not going to extend the 7 line forever. They're going to someday. Yeah. And yeah, there's like the S, which doesn't take you very far at all. It's like, why would I take the S? I can walk that far. It's so short. But there is the infamous M42 bus that goes back and forth on 42nd Street, which is like the cross town route. It also goes to the Javits, right? It does. And let me tell you... Uh, I walk faster than that bus, even when there's no traffic. That yeah, bus- see, there's so much traffic, right? That that's like that's the reason I don't do buses. Because the point of using mass transit is I don't want to be in the traffic, right? It's like if I'm gonna be in the traffic, I'll just freaking drive my tiny car and pass by everyone else. Uh, so if I'm gonna get in a bus, right? It better pass by all the traffic, so the better like a bus lane or something. No one else can get into at all. Seattle has that. It's pretty good, but yeah, it basically. My ideas with mass transit are that we need absolutely radical, very expensive, taxpayer-funded initiatives for mass transit. Yep. And 
The ox- the actual solution, in my opinion. You also have to just dick over. Basically, if you want mass transit to succeed, you have to make it dick over the non-mass transit. Be like, oh well, yeah, we're just not gonna. We're gonna have one less driving lane on this road. Fuck you, cars. That's how you gotta be if you want mass transit to work. So my crazy idea, you know, the thing I think should happen is we need like every ten blocks. A cross-town, back-and-forth, constantly moving trolley. that you just, I say every five. You just walk up, and you just kind of hop on it. It goes like 30 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour, something nice and slow. Maybe it slows down in certain loading areas, but it's just free. It just goes. has a robot so it doesn't run over little kids or something. They should just have a, con- you know, like at the airport where they had a conveyor belt to go back and forth. Uh, how are things that go perpendicular to it going to get over it if it's a conveyor belt? It has to stop for the perpendicular things. It'll just, the whole thing will stop. Yeah. So when does it stop? It's a conveyor belt. It just stops. All the bad people fall over. It's synchronized with the traffic lights. So when the cars are going north and south, it stops. And then when the cars are going east and west, it moves. Uh, Anyway, you know, crazy ideas like that. Just do something crazy. But Mayor Bloomberg put forth a similarly crazy idea. We've got these buses and they suck. Why don't we just make them? Why do they suck? Why don't we just make them free? Just drive them all the time. Anyone can get on. Anyone can get off. You don't have to pay a fare. We don't have to wait and collect fares. It'll make them move faster. It'll be more efficient, less overhead. And if it takes any congestion off of any of the other stuff, we'll basically make money on it. Hmm. And people are mad about this, and I don't understand why. Why would you be mad about it? Because it it might cost more initially. I don't know. (laughs) It seems like people just rabble about mass transit because they feel like mass transit has to be profitable. They think of mass transit in this kind of absolute sense of if it costs more money to run than we get out of it directly, it's a waste of money because they don't understand all the kind of secondary and tertiary benefits that they can't see that actually in the end are a net profit. But well, that's I the digress. thing is that they, they run. The problem is that the government is run like a business, right? In that you know you have to you know the 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 checkbook has to be in the black. And while you know you shouldn't spend well, except it's not in the black and it's never been in the black. Well, that's except, it, right. First except of all, under Clinton, you shouldn't spend more than you've taxed. That's for sure, right? Not necessarily. However. Right. Uh, just because an individual thing that you are spending money on isn't bringing a, you know, a return on investment in cash back into the government coffers. If it's, you know, it's it's the government's job is not to, you know, be profitable. I mean, you basically take tax money, spend it. You don't have to make the money back. Well, no, I'll simplify As the, long as you tax it. The, huh? the government really has one job, and that is to make sure that Mad Max doesn't happen. Right, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> that's basically what it does. But, you know, I digress. We don't want to talk about this forever. You want to hear about Kineticon. That's why you're here. Anyway. I bring this up because I suggested not that long ago a show about Mass Transit, and Scott was like, I have nothing to say about that. What's there to say? It sucks. It's never going to be fixed. Clearly, we had a lot to say, and I think it will be fixed someday. I don't think it'll ever be fixed. Okay. Never. Anyway. Anyway, so there's just an overflow of tech news relative to other newses, right? There's not so much gaming news, but there will be after PAX, I guarantee it. And there's not so much anime news, because we already used it all in the San Diego and the Otakons. But there's a ton of tech news, and we don't have enough to, you know, if we only did it on Monday, we wouldn't get to it all. So I want to do this one real quick. Uh, today, Google, or yesterday, I don't even remember, recently, Google bought this company, right, called uh, On2. I'm pretty sure that's what their name is. And they basically make video codecs. That's what they do. And uh, the, re- the thing behind this is it relates to something we talked about previously on the show. HTML5. About the HTML5 video codec. You see, Og Theora, right, the open source video codec, was actually, uh, basically what happened is this company, the On2 company, made a bunch of different codecs, and they kept making new versions of it. One of their old versions, I think like version 2 or version 5 or 3, I forget what number. 2, right? what would it, they're already just on, throw out numbers, 18, They're, they're already on version like 9. So an old version of their, of their uh, codec was open sourced, right, unconditionally. And that was what was the foundation for Og Theora, right? And one of the big arguments against Og Theora is that it's just not quality enough compared to like H264. But it is open source, which means, and there's no, it's, you know, it's, but there's still some questions of like patent encumbrance. I don't know where those questions are coming from. So basically Google, you know, this is big battle of H264 versus, you know, Og Theora. If Google is going to buy this company, well, they already did buy this company. Clearly, they have some sort of plan. Yeah, basically what they're going to do is they're going to remove 
you know, most likely they're going to remove all patent encumbrance from Og and from the newer codex well, from in, this onto company. At least insofar as that can be done, because patent it's yeah. There's always some sort Regardless, of patent liability. Right? I mean, they're Twitter get, just got sued. Uh, they're gonna yeah. They're gonna you know get rid of all those sorts of problems with their Google monies, right? And they're going to uh, you know open source this better codec, right? And hopefully Og Theora will just merge all that in, and uh, so. Basically, all the browsers, you know, they're going to be like, all right, look, you people, we may- we got this new codec, you know, it's bigger and badder and better than your Og Theoras, and it's open source, and it's not in comfort, all right? So now you got no complaints. It's basically the, you know, the- there were all these arguments against HD64 and all these arguments against Og Theora. Well, it's like they're going to say, here, we just bought this one. This doesn't have any of those complaints. Everyone fucking use it. And if everybody- anyone says no, then they're going to be like, well, why not? You know, fuck you. <laughs> We went, look, you got no complaints against this. So it's going to be interesting to see what complaints people will have against it. <laughs> but anyway, things of the day. So at Kineticon, we the one time we really got to get out of the room and go anywhere other than panel five. Uh, 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 panel, panel five, five, panel, panel five. five. <laughs> Somehow it doesn't quite have the same energy when you're not in the room and there's a crowd there. Disco stew likes disco panels. <laughs> we need a disco panel, something fierce. Who knows about disco? I know a little bit about disco. Enough to do a panel? I think I could put together a panel on disco. Well, How- if you got a book about disco on Reddit, then you could do a panel about Wikipedia it. Wikipedia plus YouTube equals disco panel. It's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> rah, 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 speak to you. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so we went to Super Art Fight, and I got to see two of the three fights because then I had to go do stuff before. You know. I saw all three fights. Well, I can say one thing. The first fight, uh, our friend Yuko of Johnny Wander fame uh, competed and won, even though, to be fair, it was a Yuko crowd. It was a Yuko crowd. <laughs> it seems like the art fight really did, the crowd did matter a lot. You know? Well, the thing is, it, the whole thing is it's not the quality of the art necessarily. It's who grandstands for the crowd the most. And the best. <laughs> but when the ref brought out the yellow flag, that was when I lost it. But we, you know, beforehand, there's these six panels, and two artists have to draw stuff. And every few minutes, they change this spinner, and then the artists are given more things to incorporate into the drawing. So ahead of time, we bought Sight Unseen for $20. The lower left panel, which is where Yuko was standing. Mm -hmm. And ahead of time, we yelled at her, other than use a splash attack, Yuko, to make our panel proud. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, our panel has Super Macho Man Randy Savage, attorney at law. I would like to note the tank briefcase. And behind him is Bruce Campbell in a Bill Cosby sweater. Yep. So my thing of the day is that. And if you look online, you can probably find some sort of picture of all six panels together. But Super Art Fight, if you ever see it, because it is done live, not just at fan conventions, but out in the real world, you should check it out. I guess we don't need to talk about that during the show then. No, we don't. Oh, my God, is it awesome. Super Art Fight for the win. Yep. So uh, what was my thing of the day? Oh, yes. On Kotaku, there was actually an article that wasn't just like a reprint of a press release. (laughs) It was written by this guy in Japan, and he was talking about the Pokemon Stamp Rally. Do you know about this? I know nothing about this. Apparently, it's been going on for 10 years, and the way it works, right, is they send out to all the kitties, right, this little book that has spots for six stamps in it, right? Wait, do you have to go find these stamps? There are 95 train stations on the Japan, you know, basically start the Japan train lines, right, that have stamps. So the way it works is you go and you get six stamps in your little book, right, by going to six train stations, any six train stations that have stamps. And at these train stations, there's basically a guy there guarding the stamp. And you walk up in line. You know, it's all kids, right? They walk up all polite in line. They, they walk up, he stamps your book, and you, you go, right? Oh, man, kids need some sort of Yakuza conspiracy where they knock that over, grab the stamp, and run. Right, they, they have guards with all these stamps on tables. They've been doing this for 10 years. Yeah, the kids are just not good right. enough. They need to pull a heist. So I don't think anyone's ever stolen the stamp. Anyway, you get six stamps, and then you bring your little six-stamp book to one of, like, the major stations, like Tokyo or, you know, whatever. Then they give you, in exchange for your six-stamp book, they give you the 95-stamp book, they give you a Pikachu visor, 
and some other stuff, right? Ooh. Then you go around getting all 95 stamps from Man. all 95 train stations on the Japan train line. So uh, the question is, what do you get at the end of that, Mewtwo? If you get all 95 stamps, right, of all the 95 different Pokemans, then uh, you have a chance to win various prizes. Like what? Basically crap, like a stuffed uh, Pokemon or... See, this is so close. They need to just make the definitive Pokemon MMO that is on every platform and goes well, forever no, and have Pokemon in the real world with transponders hidden yes. that you can go find. Regardless, the, this article was not, was you know, it, it discussed the Pokemon stamp rally. But what it really discussed was like the mental, the kleptomaniac mentality of like Japanese people. And it got into all this, you know, really... Really interesting stuff. Like, if one thing that was really interesting he talked about was how, you know, in the U.S., we could rent video games, right? But uh, in Japan, you know, they Nintendo and people actually put up a big fight so that you couldn't rent video games in Japan. So what happened was, in Japan, since there was no video game rental, the used video game market appeared much, much sooner than, you know, it did here. Right? So people were pretty much buying games, beating them, selling them real, you know, quick, and buying new ones, right? And uh, anyone then eventually, you know, a market appeared for people who would just wait and buy the used copies for cheap. And of course, Nintendo didn't like that. So uh, what they did is they started making games, you know, that were long. And that's why you get like the JRPG that's just incredibly long. And, you know, you're, so you're not going to buy it and then return it used right away. It's going to be a lot longer before someone can get a used copy. See, except at the same and a time, much greater chance that used copy buyers is just going to buy the, you know, the full version. What with fans? I mean, you, I go to like a GameStop or something. And they'll have those brand new long games. Well, that's because in the U.S. and GameStop, people steal games from one GameStop and sell them back to another one. Yeah, but that's I digress. Yeah, the the point is, this article is really, really fascinating, and you should read it. I have one more minor thing of the day, and it's relevant and pertinent and timely. Uncle Yo was at Kineticon. Many of you saw his show. His show was basically Yo. standing room only. Carl Custer. He is doing his first Custer's Revenge for real comedy show out in the real world as in not at like a, a convention is not in a real world right no it's not it's, <laughs> just, it's a cloister it's like this private walled garden i mean it, it is it's is a very different crowd that you get at like oticon or Kineticon than you get at like some place somewhere well not if you you know tell all your friends to show up from conventions it depends, because normal people will be there, too. But this yep. Saturday, August 8th, at 7 p.m. at the Drum Lounge in the Lower East Village of New York City on 85th Avenue A between 5th and 6th Street, Uncle Yo will be there. And being 85 Avenue A, not 85th. I was reading. I didn't know 85th where it was. 85th is way north. I saw this sentence, and I read it as quickly as I could while I was doing other stuff and preparing for the rest of the show. Yep. Anyway, there's a link to it in our forums. There's a link on the website. There's a pretty good chance a lot of us will be there. Scott I would, won't. I would go if I wasn't going to Connecticut. Yep, but Scott's going to Connecticut for something. Yep. All right, so, so Connecticut. Connecticut. Oh, shit. Connecticut uh, 2009. Let's not talk about every single panel we did individually. I want to mention every panel. I I'll mention this. This was a very special Connecticut for us. A little bit of meta perspective here. We've been going to Connecticut for a number of years, and... Very rapidly, our Kineticon experience has changed. The first year we went, we were just fans, and we walked into the Anime Club like Summit, How to Run an Anime Club panel. The panel was kind of poorly run and was giving, basically, illegal advice. So we stood up and we're like, no, that's not how it is, and we ran the rest of the panel. We then kind of trashed Kineticon on Geek Nights, and the con chair and the vice con chair emailed us and said, yeah, you know what? All your complaints were justified. Put up or shut up. You want to fix it? And we were like, hells yeah. And the next year, we did like seven panels. <laughs> and every year, we've done, you know. The thing is, I have four Kineticon badges, so I don't, I don't really remember the sequence of events. I think we did seven panels last year. So the year before that, maybe we only did like two no, panels. No, we did more panels that year, and then we did fewer panels the next year because those panels killed us because we weren't good at doing that many panels I, yet. I don't even remember. I need. I, I should save the con books, but I keep throwing them all away. I remember pretty well, and I have you know records of all the cons we go to and records of all the panels we've ever done. So all right, no. I can show you a list of every single panel we've ever done at every con ever. All right. Anyway, so we did all these things, and every year you know, we kind of escalated. This year was the penultimate escalation. We did, well, we produced or sponsored 37 panels at Kineticon. Of those panels, 
23 were 100% us, and six more were mostly us. Yeah, what uh, what percentage of those 23 were bullshit? And which ones were real? You know what I would say? I would say, you know, all told, going through the schedule again, only four of the panels we ran were bullshit. So 19 real panels. That were just us. How just many of the Scott. How many of the real panels were basically just show videos, don't do anything? Now the, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, is the craziest anime deaths any less of a panel than bite-sized anime? Bite-sized anime was mostly a sit there, don't say much, just show videos panel. So is anime's craziest deaths. Anime's craziest deaths requires you to actually describe in great detail the deaths. This bite-sized anime doesn't require as Do much. Do you really need to describe the anime's craziest death when you've just shown someone getting killed in People a crazy People don't way. know what it was from, and it's not in the proper context. They don't know who's dying and why. Plus, bite-sized anime, we talked a lot about Dameka Dobutsu. We talked enough about Dameka Dobutsu. Detroit Metal City. We said all there was to say. I don't know why you're so down on these panels. That was like I'm one of the I'm not down. I just want to get a real count of, you know, how many panels were super for real panels. Well, what do you mean super for real? What's like, your Like, we actually had to talk for the whole time. So, do we want to call that something different from a panel, then? Because a panel is a panel, as opposed to a showing, which is no commentary, just <laughs> a showing. I'm just trying to give an accurate picture. We sponsored of how much effort we exerted. We exerted a lot of effort. 37 <laughs> panels that we scheduled and put together in like two weeks. Yep. So the basically Friday, since we were the only ones who took the day off and went there Friday, and we no one, everyone else showed up Friday night or Saturday, we pretty much sat in one room running panels all day, doing nothing else. I didn't even leave the room for a long period of time. I didn't go to the dealer's room. I didn't go to the artist alley. I didn't go to any of the panels. I, I didn't play to, any games. I went to many of those things because unlike Scott. I barely Scott, even got to eat any food. I was able to walk around and take care of stuff. So I went and helped someone set up in the dealer's room. And I, I saw the dealer's room. And I went to the, like, I basically went everywhere in the con. But we basically were in panel five running panels from like 9 a.m. until midnight. Uh, it was pretty rough. Uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna read all the titles quickly once just to get a scale of this. Good morning, Kineticon. Bite-sized anime. Losing should be fun. Beyond Dungeons and Dragons. The uh, Beyond Dungeons and Dragons QA conceptual game design action castle, which was actually not run by us. Kineticon Live surviving the mecha attack by Uncle Yo, not run by us. Beyond Candy Land comics for the manga reader. Tales from the Anime Club. Anime openers. Lazy Matsumoto's Galaxy Express. Three nine nine. Some notable things. Well, I guess three nine. Some or notable nine, things nine, nine. from Not that. Three nine nine. Yes, uh, notables. Uh, I just I don't care about the chronological order. I just I just try to remember, keep that all in my head. Well, I got to uh, say this: bite-sized anime was pretty popular. One because there wasn't much else going on at the time, but two. I've learned something. No one out there has seen Damaka Dobutsu or no. Detroit Metal City or Gog Maga or any of this stuff. But everyone loves all of these shows. The only mistake we made in this panel was that we showed Gog Manga Biori, Detroit Metal City, and Dameko Dobutsu before we showed Zenryoku Usagi. Because we showed Zenryoku Usagi first. Wow, Zenryoku Usagi is awesome. It is not quite as crazily awesome as Dameko Dobutsu. <laughs> But I gotta say, people really liked Gog Manga Viori. <laughs> that show How is like. Not? But it's a show where people like people don't get it at first. Like you can see the audience and they're watching. And for the first two minutes, they just don't get it. They're like, eh, what's this? I don't get it. What's going on? But then like the three punch joke at the end with the kid and the sticker and the peeling the sticker, and then that they're done. Yep. So, uh, first of all, Beyond Candyland, this is something to talk about because it's a brand new panel. We it basically is. practiced it at pa uh, at uh, Kineticon. It is four packs. It is which four is packs, which is up. in like a month, right? So Not even a It is exactly Labor a month. Labor Day weekend, right. So we practiced it at Kineticon, and I basically slapped it together real quick like a week or two ago, and we just did it, and we didn't prepare that much, but it was actually way, way, way better than I anticipated. Like, it doesn't need that much. Much more polished for packs. It's well, it, like ready to go. It's definitely a panel that writes itself because the first half is kind of tough to figure out. You know, we we debated as Scott was throwing together the slideshow before Kineticon, like, you know, two days before Kineticon. <laughs> like, you know, should we talk about this then this? What's the idea? Should we bring up game theory? Yeah, like, basically, stuff, I just got to reorder a few slides that are sort of out of order, and this panel will be pretty great. After that, like, after we get all the theory and like stuff out, the whole second half of the panel, once Scott figured out the order of board games to talk about, 
it is just like it was gold before we even gave it like it's just so easy to talk about puerto rico and tigers and euphrates <laughs> yep so uh if you're going to pax or any other convention this is a brand new panel which means it's going to be a whole year before it expires so if you go to see us you know anytime in like 2000 you know between uh you know basically Kinetic you know what? before kinetic 2010 i can list if you're going to go to Either Penny Arcade Expo or the New York Comic Con or Anime Boston will probably run it in Anime Boston too, but yep. we're going to run it at a lot of places. Yep, so look forward to Beyond Candyland, an awesome panel about awesome board games that has nothing to do with anime. Sorry, Anime Boston. I hope We'll see what happens. Yeah, the <laughs> thing is, Beyond D&D was like our biggest panel at both Anime Boston and at uh, Oticon. So. I know, it's, it's sad. Yeah, but we ran that again, and we actually did a Q&A, and that worked pretty well. I definitely have to point out Action Castle because yes. we got Luke Crane and Jared Sorensen to come to Kineticon. Which it was it was remarkably difficult. Like we're, I was a miracle that we got them to show up. I mean, I'm glad you know I thank them for coming and and staying as long as they stayed and doing what they did. But you know, just to be perfectly honest, you know, Jared basically showed up. Did his thing real quick, and then he was gone. Yeah, but to his credit, he showed up. Basically, I gave him a schedule that was a half hour off. That was, because, yeah, that was Rim's fault. Because the, and That's why I didn't say he showed up late, because Rim messed that up, telling him the wrong time to show up. Well, because the, ske the Kineticon schedule, you know, since we're in charge of this next year, we're going to rework how it looks. But basically, I gave everyone the schedule exactly a half hour off, and Jared was incommunicado, completely just off the face of the earth. Luke didn't even know where he was. And exactly the second I had told him to show up, he, like, he just appears in the room. So... For the first half of conceptual game design, I had to make up the conceptual game design panel because Scott uh, Scott couldn't deliver. Scott uh, couldn't come up with a panel on the fly. Well, I wasn't going to steal someone else's panel, and I was tired, and I didn't give a shit. Yeah, Plus, was... you know, you left me hanging in the morning. You're running around setting up wait, uh, wait. dealer's room tables. I left you hanging for 10 minutes at Good it Morning lot, It was a lot more than 10 minutes. Uh, actually, because I have the tweets uh, that were going out and the text messages. I know the minute I was back in that room. Uh -huh. I can go look. But beyond... Uh, Beyond Good Morning Kineticon. How hard is Good Morning Kineticon? You say Good Morning Kineticon, then you sit there. I basically did the whole thing, and then you showed up and, and repeated everything I had already done. Yeah, and you know what? The crowd seemed to really like that. Anyway. They did. But uh, I think I came up with a pretty good 10-minute conceptual game design panel, and the crowd liked it. No. Yeah. Uh, I believe Scott got they served. Liked it they liked anything better than sitting there doing nothing. I could have gotten up and just did the elephant dance. They would have loved that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... Well, they, I don't think they could have told it was an elephant dance. <laughs> it depends on the crowd. Anyway. Anyway, so... The, uh, yeah, he ran Action Castle, and he ran it just like he ran it at PAX, and it was totally awesome. One thing I can say, though... Like, people didn't know what to expect. And the whole con, people are asking us ahead of time, like, what is Action people Castle? People asked us, what is, people kept asking us, what's Action Castle? What's Crab People? What's Action Castle? What's Crab People? Let me tell you, we learned something. If you make a description like that, people will show up. And as long as you can deliver something that lives up to the description, even if it does not match the description, you're gold. But Action Castle, by the end of it, like, the crowd was so, like, crazy about it that the whole con it was like this joke and people around the con instead of butt scratch -a, butt scratch -a, it was it takes a long time action castle, castle. torch hands yep torch hands action castle is going to be like a big event at Kineticon next year as we, long we as gotta we gotta get jared roped we gotta like i don't know maybe we have to like uh what do we have to do to get these people to, like, stay and keep doing stuff the way we Scott, do? Scott, schedule them for more things, for one. And two, now we know the trouble, the peril, the melancholy of Jim Voles. Because think about what he has to wrangle at Oticon in terms of guests. I know, Or right? imagine the Kineticon guest relations people. They have to deal with people like Vic and Chris, you know. That, Why are that... people so unfreaking reliable Someone tells you to show up at time, you show up. How is he unreliable? He showed up at exactly that time, and we did not schedule him for anything else. So he did not show up any other time. <laughs> he was not obligated to. He was not obligated to, but it's like, you know, if but, he would have ran but, some, you know, he could have sold a whole bunch bunch of games if he would have just run some demos he could have but he didn't want to and we did not obligate him to i did not i've learned something <laughs> i learned something very important because this is how all the other people do it if you give someone an itinerary they will show up to everything in that itinerary unless they get drunk and wander off like an unnamed voice actor at katsukan a few years ago yep. well <laughs> we're gonna have to give everyone strict itineraries 
Very to get the thing them is, to... I point out everyone showed up to their itineraries perfectly. That's true, but you know, I don't know what you're complaining about. Jared ran Action Castle, and it was epic. It was epic. I there's no no complaint we can have about his running of Action Castle. It just you know would have been nice to chat. Well, from what I hear, but he ran away. Yeah, he, he had some business to take care of that was somewhat personal, so I can't get into that. He had he had a good reason to not be around for the rest of the con, but Luke Crane was around, the creator of Burning Wheel. And the one thing I want to say about that that's kind of meta is that I could see it in his eyes. It's very different to be at a con like Kineticon as opposed to a gaming con. Yeah, because most of the cons he goes to are the tiny gaming cons, though. The Uber cons, the Dex cons, you know, all that sort of thing. Or like PAX, which is PAX. It's, it's something yeah. special. But he, I, basically, one of our friends texted me and he's like, Luke went into the rave. <laughs> and I'm like, I wonder how that's going to turn out. So he walks out of the raise, rave. And on record, the first words that were out of his mouth were basically, there are girls at this convention. <laughs> <laughs> and there's music. Yeah, that's, that's how pretty much every convention I go to is. I think he, he had this revelation that cons like this are very, very different. And they take a and long the, and time. And this convention was, you know... Like a like a quarter the size of Otakon, and uh, you know uh, only half of it was anime, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so but I wonder what he would do it at a full anime convention. Luckily, Uncle Yo showed up on Friday because you know he does con stuff. So surviving the mecha attack was standing room only, and it was just it was absolutely fantastic. Man, Uncle Yo, he just keeps improving the, his skills every time. It's like. Just every time we see him at a con, he's doing his thing. He's just getting better and better and better. Like, I wandered into the end of surviving the mecha attack. I mean, he's, he's proved if you work, if you want something, and you keep doing it and keep doing it, you just get better at it. You know, he's going to reach his 10,000 hours of practice, and you better watch out. Yes, it's the pendulette method of success. And you know what? It's pretty much proven at this point. I mean, Bill Gates, us... Pendulette. Pendulette. If, Uncle, Uncle Yo. Yo. If you want to be like any of these people, all you have to do is ruin the early half of your life. Just keep doing something a whole bunch and you'll get good at it naturally. Well, you also you actually have to want it. If you don't want it, you're not going to pull up that pigeon. Man, I, I, I walked by a pigeon today near the post office. Dude, every time. It was the fattest, slowest pigeon. <laughs> I was like, oh, fuck you. I could have had you. I'm gonna, I, the only reason I don't do it is I don't have gloves. I swear to God, I'm going to get some fucking gloves from Home Depot. I'm going to pick up so many freaking pigeons. But here's the thing. You, I'm going to you know, put them in a sack, too. Then I have this big sack that's just flopping around. That is the analogy. Out, like a cartoon. That's the analogy to everyone who says they're going to do a webcomic or says they're going to make an e-commerce. We're going to make a video of all these pigeons in a sack. Then I'm going to go in the park and dump them out on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are unaware, very briefly, because I know we have a lot of new listeners from Kineticon, and explaining these sort of things takes a long time. That's the last time I'm going to use that joke. Are you kidding? I don't think you understand. It's not It's not really uh, holding up. <laughs> oh, shit. I keep making the joke. Anyway, Pendulette and Teller, you know, Penn and Teller, they're trying to do this magic trick where they have to, like, grab a dove. And it's a they, pigeon. Well, yeah. In a park. They were doing doves. In Central Park. They had specially trained doves. I'm and the, no, I'm pretty sure it was a pigeon in Central uh, no, Park. No, Scott, you clearly do not remember the story, as you tend to not remember. So they had to do a bit where they had to grab doves, which are basically just tame, pretty-looking pigeons uh, in terms of demeanor. I'm pretty sure. Uh, so they're trying to do this and they can't like they can't grab them. Like they're like they're having all this trouble and they're getting frustrated with these trained birds. And Penn just wanders away and he's sitting in the park and he's frustrated and he sees this pigeon and he's thinking about it. He's like, you know what? I want that pigeon. I just I want it. 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 And he just went ha and grabbed it. And he realized suddenly that uh, you just have to want it. And up until that point, he did not want the bird in his hand. He did not actually fully with his heart and viscerally want it. So he didn't. He couldn't pick it up. He didn't have the guts. He didn't have the Gurren Lagan. But if he wanted it, he fucking wanted it. So because he picked think it about up. it, you put your hands towards a pigeon, right? Even if it's clean, it's like you hesitate. You're like, ew. And you think about holding it in your hand. It's like, ew. You know, it's like it's. You don't really want to hold it. But if you want to hold it. Nothing is stopping you. But at the and same that's time. Why, that's why lion eats man, because lion wants to eat man, but man doesn't want to eat lion. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanted to eat the lion and you were, you know, strong, you're vicious enough, you could probably take it out. Uh, gotta, You'd get on that lion's back, bite him in the throat, rip his whatnots out. Not everybody can be Guru Gamesh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, some people can But anyway, can be. Only, like I wanted to want it to the end of 
Uncle, Uncle Yo and George surviving the Mecha attack because we had Beyond Candyland next. And I caught this bit that was basically, do you understand how much it costs to run an Atano circus? <laughs> Here's the cost of one missile. And I had this idea, and I hope they incorporate it, too. They need a video of, like, Mac, like some sort of Itano circusy show and just have the digital counter in the bottom of how much it costs. <laughs> That'd be good. Very good. It takes uh, a lot of video editing skills, though. And we tried out another panel late at night, and I'm real pleased with this panel. I just have to tweak it and, you know, replace the crab people versions of, like, the YouTube videos with DVD rips. But anime openers and closers from around the world. Yeah, we I need a few more foreign ones. Well, we did a lot of Japan-America comparisons. We only did a handful of uh, European and uh, otherwise comparisons. Well, I had quite a few. The problem is there aren't that many, except for Shonen fighting shows. They're... Remember, an anime only has its own. We're just trying to get some Hokuto no Ken from around the world. You are shock. Plus, there, there's not that much. I was looking around. Most people didn't dub it. Uh. Or I can't get it. Because remember, for stuff that's weird like that, I'm basically reliant on YouTube. Yeah, I know. And right? possibly BitTorrent. And uh, luckily, I met some people. One guy showed me this opener to something, and he's going to send me a copy of it to nice, incorporate into the nice. panel. But I had some good stuff. I found that good uh, DuckTales thing. And, I think uh, Chinese Ava was a good new highlight. Oh, my God. Chinese Ava. I got to try to find a better copy, but I searched for days, and that's the best I could find. Damn. Uh, people were very surprised by Foxbot Escaflone because no one expected that. <laughs> Actually, what was scary about that panel is we kept showing, like, the her the horrible openers, and people actually sort of wanted to watch some of them. Like, we st we, we put on, you know, gotta go, gotta go one piece, and Luke Crane was actually like, hey, when we stopped it. Like, he wanted to see the rest of it. <laughs> well, I because Luke Crane is one of those people who grew up on, you know, the Star Blazers equivalent, so he... He basically Apparently he grew up on Bandai Robot. Yep. He's one of those people who probably and I see this a lot. They kind of got into anime back then, but then they fell out of it because there was no more anime like that available. Yep. And I feel like people like that could get back into anime. We were watching those old mecha openers. He's like, I own that one. I'm like, oh shit. You yeah. serious? <laughs> <laughs> you got like a grandizer in your basement? Yep. And he's and you know, I knew Lion on the chest shoots a laser. Mm -hmm. I did not know Lion's eyes also shoot laser, different laser. The two lasers can also combine. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Kineticon Live was kind of a BS panel. We threw that in there just to, you know, kill an hour. Are we actually going to put that up as an episode? I probably will because you know what? The crowd, there was a put pretty... the experimental or supplemental feed or something. I'm going to put everything I recorded in the experimental feed, mostly unedited. But people oh, see. Seemed... good idea. One thing I noticed, our so-called BS panels where we would basically sit there and kind of make up a panel as we went. We'd have between 40 and 80 people in the room, and they seem to really like it. It's kind of weird. People pretty much liked you know, Basically, we, it felt like a lot of the stuff we did at Kineticon, it's like we just reused the same materials over and over again, sort of remixed them. You know, we tell the same joke like five times a day, but the crowd was always slightly different with only a few people that had been there. But it there. works really well because, one, the, the, like a comedy routine, you know, you make the joke, and then you build on it periodically throughout the routine, and then you end on the original joke and bring it full circle. Yes, but that's not what we did. What we did was tell the exact same joke pretty much like three times a day uh, to three different Different groups of people but with, it'd be interesting but because luckily the groups had such a small overlap that there weren't too many people complaining that you know oh, i heard but that one no, already the, the few people who were there because you know we'd use the joke in a different context or we'd reference an anecdote but we wouldn't fully explain it but you'd see like there was that one kind of front row gang in the lower like right half of the panel room that was there like all day and they would like nod at each other and be like, yeah, yeah, whenever we referenced an anecdote from a previous panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, plus anyone who's going to come at our, to our panels that frequently, like someone who was there all day, those are the kind of people who are like our big fans. And we could just sit up there going, boobity, 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 And they'd just be like, wee, so whatever. You know, they'll, they'll take whatever we're going to say. Anyway, uh, any other exciting panels we ran on Friday? Well, we also tried out Losing Should Be Fun, which is the yeah. much more difficult to write panel for PAX because <laughs> I, I very much sold it to a lot of people, and it's more of a conceptual it's, it's theory It's definitely a good panel. It just needs a little bit more polish, like a double polish. Well, the thing is, I realized... Wax on, wax off. I, I rewrote it, and I think it's almost done. I just have to get the pictures to fill in the new slideshow, but... Mm -hmm. What I realized about losing should be fun is that it's primarily theory and explanation. 
and it doesn't have the fallback of here are 10 great games and why they're great. Yep. Because there aren't games. Like Beyond D&D has the here are the indie RPGs you should play. And Beyond Candyland has here are board games. Look Losing at Should Be Fun has UFO 5440 and Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, we should get some natural selection in there and, you know, some other games. And They're sorta. in there. Mostly I need, you know, I basically need to add more We should theory. get a video of turtling in NS to put in there. Ah, yeah, we could try to get that. We got time. Like got- an audio list video of turtling? The audio might be good, too, though, because you'll get that same guy. Yeah, yeah, get him, oh, Gorgie. If he's, if he's playing, that's definitely the video to keep. I got to contact that guy. I Alien need... Commander. Yeah. Alien Commander. You do LSD once in your life. Yeah. If anyone out there knows Alien Commander in natural selection, it's not a big community. Someone knows him personally. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let us know. I want to get him on the show. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask him. Speaking of which, at PAX, uh, Unknown Worlds is going to have a booth. We're going to get to meet the Flayra. Oh, my God. We got to. I don't know. Uh, more likely, he's going to get to meet us. All right. <laughs> oh, shit. It's oh, Geek shit. Nights. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask if we can get a press badge in addition to our uh, special guest badge. Good idea. Because the press ba- and the special guest badge, it's kind of like paranoia. It gets you into weird places, but it's weird to try to interview someone with that badge. Like, <sighs> to interview, think about that. Interviewing someone who has the same badge you do. Kind of weird. Very weird. We got to get a different badge. Well, they're going to have exhibitor professional type badges, probably. Yeah, it's weird because we Industry had... badge? I don't know what they have. No, because a lot of the guests had the same badge we had last year. Oh, well, yeah, get... I mean, you know, uh, like, uh, yeah, we, the bad the badge we had last year was what, like, special... It was special, like, presenter, panelist, presenter, something. I have something a picture like of it. Something like that, yeah. It was blue. Yeah, that was the same badge that, like, you know, MC Frontalot had or whatever, right? You know, it's the someone's doing events badge. That's what we had, so... Yeah, that's that's a good badge to have. So, anyway, uh, one other, you know, outside of panel five, this this con review is very meta as opposed to our, you know, normally a convention review. We talk a lot about, you know, all the events at the con. We went to this, we did this. Thing is, we didn't go to much. We didn't go to anything, and also it's because, a miracle that we played two board games because we're basically staff at Kineticon at this point. Our Kineticon reviews, uh, hopefully you'll find this stuff interesting, are very inside baseball, what it's like yeah, to be. Yeah, it's from the back looking out instead of the out looking in. Which is one of those things that we always really, really like to see. Because the first time we sat in like an artist alley or like talked to dealers for real, it's weird how any fan convention has like these 10 different perspectives. And depending on who you are and what badge you have... It is a completely different experience to go to the con. Yep, I think it's actually good for us to do the review like this from the back to the front because, you know, there's a million con review podcasts. We've done them. Our fellow friendly podcasters have done a hundred of them, right? And they're all sort of very similar. You know, this we went to these panels. They were good. They were bad, right? Doing one from the back to the front, I think, is a, a lot rarer thing. You're not going to hear a lot of these out in the podcasting world or just in the world in general, right? Reviews of something from the back looking out. You don't hear like, you know, a, it's like a book review by the author, you know, or the editor right, <laughs> wait, of wait, the wait. book. A uh, book review by the author. This book's fucking awesome. Right. <laughs> but the, the thing is, right, imagine if there were like 100 authors of the book. It was, it was like an anthology, and one guy reviewed the whole thing, you know. His part, you know, he'll talk about. And the other thing is that I think people know and they trust us and that we're very honest even about our own shit. You know, we'll tell you when we do something that sucks. We'll be like, yeah, our shit sucked there. We'll get to that. We had a, we had a couple of panels. <laughs> we had a few suckiness <laughs> around. But what can, you know, considering the quantity versus the proportion of suck, we did pretty damn good, I think. Oh, my God. I mean, could you do better? I will, if you I, can do better, <laughs> if you think you can do better, well, you'll get a chance. Us, you'll get your chance next, Connecticut. We'll talk about that at the end, but very briefly, Scott and I are now the heads of panels and workshops for Connecticut. It is us, 100%. The buck stops with us. Panels are our responsibility. So stay tuned to the end because we're already working on next Connecticut schedule. I've already lined up some panels. Good God. Yep. Like we're going to be I've done. I've already lined up my own panel. I lined up I lined up some external panels and you you guys are going to be surprised. I'm thinking maybe like if, you know, since we're running we're both running the panels that like if we both did a panel, it actually might be sort of troublesome if we're needed. Maybe we should do like some individual panels. There will be very few panels at Kineticon, sadly, for many of you who are fans of us, that are both me and Scott, because that's kind of like putting the president and the vice president in the same room at the same time. Very bad. <laughs> yeah. So 
But it, regardless, we'll talk about that at the end because that's the uh, least interesting part to people who went to this Connecticut and want to hear about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, too, our last panel of the night, we were originally going to talk about and then show the Galaxy Express 3 Nines movie, which is one of the greatest animated movies ever made. And there's this whole story Emily still hasn't it. seen it. When do you want to watch it? You want to watch it tomorrow, maybe? Maybe While soon. While we're eating tacos? Yeah, either that or I kind of want to show her because I have that box set, the first episode of Tyler. Well, you can watch that, too. Yeah. It's a good one. But we, oh, yeah. Know, Rim bought the box set, box set of Irresponsible Captain Tyler in the dealer's room. I'm so excited about this. That's like my favorite anime ever. I, You know, I talk about anime a lot. I'm an anime fan. Irresponsible Captain Tyler, unlike any other anime or even media that I have read or seen, it influenced my life pretty directly. And when I was young and I saw this show, I very seriously kind of based my life and my worldview on this anime. <laughs> I, uh, what did I, I bought Dread, the Jenga RPG in the dealer's room. Yeah, I, I uh, ordered Jenga on Amazon because we don't own oh, did it. did you already order it? I ordered you it. You clicked the button? I clicked the button. Wow. Oh, Rim shit. did something. Well, I needed some other stuff. Uh, also, I bought, uh, when I bought that, I got for free a uh, trade of uh, Omega the Unknown Classic. We'll see how that is. You know, it was funny because <laughs> you got this copy for free of that at the con. And then we walk over to another booth. This other booth that was selling all these cheap old Marvel trades, like a hundred copies of it, just stacked up. They were like, a, they were like five. Yeah, the bucks. thing is, it'll be good because I'm, I planned, you know, I had planned for a while to buy the newer remake uh, of Omega the Unknown that's supposed to be really freaking awesome. And now I'll get the background info, even if the background info is really bad old Marvel comics. Uh, what else I get in the dealer's room there? We got something. That was quite a digression. Yeah, I know. I just right, while, right. we were, while we were thinking of it, I didn't last digression. We talked about we did comics for the manga reader, which is always an easy to run popular panel, which was cool because there were like half the people in the room, they were like, "Yeah, we read comics and manga. We know the score," but they didn't read most of the things we brought up, and they were taking notes. In fact, a lot of people were taking. It was strange. It was actually strange. Like you go to other cons, and I see like uh, when we were doing Beyond D and D, there were a few people taking notes at Otakon Beyond D and D. At Kineticon, it seemed like everyone was fucking taking notes. Like, there at, was just so much note-taking at, at all uh, of our panels. Like, at anime you should see, there was this one cool guy in the back, and he sat there, and every anime we brought up that he had clearly not seen, he wrote it down, and I could see him, like, putting different numbers of stars next to them. Really? Yeah. Uh. Let me tell you, Princess Tutu seems to have, you got a circle. Oh, we that, brought our princess maybe a Tutu. circle means don't watch. I don't know. Maybe put a line through a Ghostbusters style. I don't know, but we showed Princess Tutu. And well, we'll get to that because that's Saturday. We're yeah. going. But anyway, to get back on track, uh, comics for the manga reader. We talked about Black Sad, which is super hard to get. It's this amazing French comic. So walking around the dealer's room, Emily sees in the distance and says, is that Black Sad? And I'm like, no way. So we walk over and sure enough, amidst this see this veritable ocean of furry pornography is a single mint condition copy of the second volume of black sad in english for 20 bucks ching i bought that thing like faster like i almost killed the dealer just jumping over him to get it all right some things we saw in the dealer's room but did not buy let's see oh there was um the uh carcassonne the catapult oh my god <laughs> which is the a cat- new <laughs> we're no we, we, we see it I a just... new carcassonne expansion that has a working catapult you... i guess you fling meeples with it oh it's just it's <laughs> That's got to be bad. But the thing the is, guy at the booth was like, yeah, I stopped with that one. We were laughing at it, and the guy comes over, and he was clearly the guy know, working the people. Yeah, the guy whose booth it was, and he was well, just like, yeah, yeah. All right, since we've digressed, the other cool thing we saw, two cool things in the dealer's room. One, way back at the Jersey Shore, we saw, you know how you can make a crystal with like a 3D image inside of it? Yep. And we wondered how it was made, but we didn't do any research. But I posited that very soon it was going to be fairly easy to do, and we're going to see these things entering into geeky geeky crafty realms at Kineticon, there was someone who was clearly started doing this and we asked him how do you do it and we learned how to make those things we'll Basically, talk yeah you get a crystal and you get three lasers and if the lasers all hit each other in the same spot, it basically makes a bubble in the crystal because it's hot enough. But it's not hot enough if you only have one or two lasers. So there's this machine with three lasers and you program it and it makes art with little bubbles inside of a crystal. It's pretty cool. Yep. And the other thing we saw was this, these people who made custom vampire fangs. And while that sounds creepy, they're super high quality and they make them like for you, for your teeth, like perfectly right there. 
They they were pretty hardcore. Yeah, they were totally awesome. Actually. They were pretty cheap too. I was and basically surprised. they just yeah they just had people just freaking lining up. Basically they were making them constantly. The they only were even, reason I did not get even a pair. after the dealer's room closed, they were still making them like in the gaming room. Granted, a minor fuck you to those guys. That room smelled like acrylic for like eight hours. Yeah, that's why we had to leave that room. Yeah, but that aside, I, the only reason I didn't get them was that I could not sit still long enough. You know because we ran Final Five for the whole con. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, but, I mean, uh, even though I'm not a creepy vampire person, like, having a pair of vampire fangs, I mean, w- the, one of the people there was like, yeah, these have lasted me, like, 12 years. I'm like, well, shit, you know, who knows when I'll need some fucking plus, fangs. what we realized, <laughs> well, Scott's a biter, so definitely, <laughs> but you can put just one in, and now you have the cute anime single fang. Yeah, basically all it is is a cap that goes over your pointy tooth and makes it even pointier. And the guy's like, yeah, you know, don't eat anything or bite anything, and obviously. don't bite yourself. Don't fall asleep with them on or you're going to wake up with a missing fang and a painful, uh, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, move back to my original point. Leiji Matsumoto's Galaxy Express 3.9. Ah. The schedule got compressed, which worked to our favor, but we couldn't show the whole movie. So instead, we demoed. We basically tried out what we were proposing to do at Otakon next year, which was MC showings of anime. So Scott, and mostly Scott, because at this point, it was all Scott. I was done. I sat in the audience and almost slept. Well, it's Galaxy Express. That's my deal. It is. But not that it is not everyone's deal. You just don't realize it yet. <laughs> Scott gave a good, you know, 15-minute, here's the deal with this, described it. It was not as good it. as I could have done it because it was midnight-ish. And then we showed to this crowd, who had pretty much never seen it, the first episode of Galaxy Express 3 Nines. And it went over really well. I think almost everyone in that room is going to watch all of the show, or at least most of it on Crunchyroll. Mm-hmm. Hopefully they all skip some of the bad episodes. Thing is, they don't get that bad. They never get to that. No, Nadia. but there are there are silly episodes. They like, never get to the island episode uh, extent. There is some. I uh, guess not, but you know, there are some that could be considered island episodes. Anyway, uh, we also the anime you should see showing. Actually, I really that was totally awesome. Like that was Saturday. Yeah. I, oh, okay. Then we'll we'll wait. All right. All right, ready for Saturday? Yeah, Saturday. So, so, anime you should see was just as awesome as it always is. We got a whole bunch of people. We told them the anime you should see. Same panel as always. What's crowded weird? as always. There are people who have been to this panel three times. And they come every time because they just enjoy it. And I don't know what's so enjoyable about it. I don't. I could see it being enjoyable. I mean, we're funny Watch guys. this, moron. Moron, I can't believe you haven't watched this. What's wrong with you? You call yourself an anime fan? You haven't watched this yet? <laughs> we said the same exact things to watch as we told you to watch the last time. I Why think, have you still not watched them? I think they always forget that they can just go to the website and download the slides and see the list. So they keep coming back after they've seen like the things they wrote down to watch more of the things that they wrote down. <laughs> Anyway, afterwards, uh, we did this. We we, did, we originally scheduled it for two hours, and I sort of wish we had had the two hours. But we had a anime you see showing, which is basically the idea was, hey, we told you what to see, but now you have no excuse. If you sit right there and don't move your ass at all, we're just gonna show them to you, right? But then be- you got no excuses for not watching this crap. But being short, you know, we only had an hour. And the scary thing is we had to turn people away because the room was full for, no, you know, anime you should see. A panel's worth of people lined up to see, see the anime you should see, but only a few of them could get in because the room was already full from anime you should see. Yeah, we got to put that in a bigger room next year. <laughs> yeah, but as a result, you know, it was cut short, the room was full. We basically showed a bunch of short things first. Which and then, I had planned to show anyway. And then one episode of something, right. and it, it worked so well. We showed the Daikon animation. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Almost, despite the Daikon animations, right, being such this incredibly important stuff, on um, a very small, small percentage of, you know, uh, American anime fans know what they are, have seen them, understand them, etc. right? So I explained the die cut animations and then showed three and four, both of them, right? Of course, if you don't know, there are only two of them, three and four. <laughs> There's no one or two. Um, and, you know, because I had explained this, you know, so intently to people, like, look at this. 1982. Nerds in a basement. Nerds in a basement drawing on cells, right? No computers, no nothing. They brought this to a convention and showed it to everyone at the convention in Osaka. Never mind the whole story about how now Studio Madhouse does the same thing for Otakon Those same people who made that eventually made Ava. What are you doing with your life sitting at this anime con, losers, right? And then I showed it to them, and I showed them the other one. 
And of course they were blown away, right? They like they were they were like clapping and I'm like, what the fuck? You no know, one who made this is here. To this day is my name Hideaki Ano no, so stop clapping. No, because if you, people <laughs> clap after a showing because it's the expression of, you know what? That was crazy awesome, and I have to express how awesome it was. Yep. <laughs> but the thing is, uh after we showed that, we showed on your mark, which no one had freaking seen. No, most one had people seen had never on your heard mark. of. And <laughs> I saw a couple of people in the audience crying at the end of it. Well, that's what it's supposed to do. I cried the first time I saw it. Miyazaki is the master. Oh, my God. Yeah. I learned there's another version of that that is also for reals to a different song. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. I learned a bunch of stuff about On Your Mark. On Your Mark. Do, do, do. Beyond what I knew. Do, 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 do. Now then, we, we did this because this is how we found out about Magnetic Robes and also... While I would normally be hesitant to do this sort of thing, I would have just showed Magnetic Rose if you had some freaking time. But there is, there happens to be for Magnetic Rose a Kevin Caldwell anime music video that expresses how amazing Magnetic Rose is as well as can be expressed. So we showed that after explaining, you know, this is just an AMV. And good God, did people love that. Yeah. Oh man, we should have used, oh no, at that panel uh, instead of at the other one. Well, my plan for Otakon, if we get the room, is to show do you know either Friday or Saturday at a k kind of early good time, anime you should see for like an hour and a half and go into more depth. I want to do two hours. All right, two hours of anime you should see. We'll start with the basics and go all the way through the obscure and everything, and then. I want the next, like, six hours in that room to be just showings and commentary, showings and commentary to introduce people to every great anime. Yep. But anyway, we also showed uh, the first episode of Princess Tutu. And let me tell I you... I think it worked. I think people realized that that was a real show and not Tutu. I, I still, you know, we talked about this in other reviews. I think we personally have caused this huge resurgence in Princess Tutu. Because, you know, we keep, and every anime you should see, it is like the poster child of don't deny an anime if you don't know what it's really about. Tutu is awesome and you'll like it. Don't be turned off by you the You know facts. what we should do? We should watch all of Fancy Lala and then start pushing that. Yeah, we should. The dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Oh, man. The sad episode where she draws the pet and, oh, my Princess God. Princess Tutu. Tutu. We should do Princess Tutu versus Fancy Lala. Dinosaurs versus dancing. You know, if we keep doing this. Then someday we're going to get to a point to where people trust us so much. That's the point where we're like, Space Sailor Photon Starlight Odin is like the best fucking show they ever. They showed Odin at the con in one of the showing rooms. We told, I don't know who went to see it. We told people not to. We told Odin. some people to. Okay. But Princess Tutu, you know, obviously the people in the audience, you know, some people were dubious. They were kind of less dubious now because a lot of people who had seen the panel before clapped and cheered and told them all to watch yeah, Princess I mean, Tutu. Yeah, I mean, look, it's basically, that's why you showed Princess Tutu last, right? It's like we show them to Daikon and they're just, and the, and the, you know, on your mark and they're just overcome with emotion at this amazingness, right? So it's like, okay, I've showed you this amazingness. You trust me now, right? You trust me enough to sit your ass and watch this Princess Tutu, you know, even though it's called Princess Tutu. I mean, they were, during the opener of Princess Tutu, I, the look on their faces, people in their crowd were like, Ah, uh, you sure, guys? Man, when she makes that pile of flowers at the end, goddamn. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. So, uh, what else did we do on Saturday? We did. We now, actually got away and were able to do things on Saturday besides just panels. Well, because, you see, for the first time ever, you know, Geek Nights is at frontrowcrew.com because the Front Row Crew is the group, and Geek Nights is just the headlining, frontlining thing of the Front Row Crew. Yes, I'm actually doing a lot of work on the website. I made a big progress. Uh, you know, I'm working on it on the train But expect such. in the next, like, it's two gonna... years to see this gigantic growing of all the other Front Row Crew stuff. Yeah, I mean, we've always planned to do it. It's just, you know, it takes a long time. We want to do it right. We don't want to, you know, we rushed into Geek Nights just to keep something up. Sort of like the same strategy GDGT had, remember? They they announced, they quit Engadget, and they said, all right, GDGT, and they started doing a podcast, you know, which is basically the continuation of the old Engadget podcast. But it took them, like, a while to actually get GDGT, the site, up. So it's all taken us uh, significantly longer. You know, it's been like, you know, four or five years. But even so, stuff's coming. Scott's Box is now on a regular schedule, rel you know, once a month. And uh, I gotta, I'm going to do the last episode of Scott's Got Robot maybe next week. I don't know. Ah. And, you know. So, yeah, it's, it's going good here. But as a result, we got together several members of the Front Row crew. And there was a large block where they presented panels. And we went to get some freaking food. <laughs> 
Yeah, I ended up getting, uh, I ate the con food once. The con food last year was actually really good. This year, not so good. Luckily, that tavern nearby, like, no one seems to know about it. You can just go there and get lunch, like, right Even away. Even though you could see it when you walk out the front door of the convention center. Yep. Despite being a brew pub, though, or, not, you know, nominally a tavern, pretty weak selection of beer. I had to suffice for the table wine, which was okay. It was pretty much just an average, you know, normal pub place. It wasn't anything special. That was like the only time we got to get outside of this freaking room and walk around. Ugh. And that there's anywhere to walk to. <laughs> At least they had, we got the awesome breakfast twice. It was and it sad, was though. Still, it was still there. That we ran anime you should see, see the anime you should see, and it was like crazy, crazy crowded. Like people were sitting on the floor crowding in, fire marshal problem. Right after that, know your creators, learn about the directors. There are like 20 people in the room. Everyone leaves. Yeah. Uh... But then we had Emily doing Living in Japan. We had... I didn't a- see it. But Ind- I'm sure it was good. We didn't get to see any of this. We had independent game development with Alex. We had Geekology, where Jess presented her research. That we was had- real popular, I heard. That was crazy popular. A lot, And it was noted in the panel feedback session by two different people as being awesome. All right. How to be a good game master with Pete and Wyatt and, you know, all the, all those, all the game masters and gamers in the front row crew. Kendo, the way of the sword with Katsunori Matsushita, who is basically a Kendo badass. And then... The Kineticon match game, which was scheduled originally for two hours plus a half hour of setup. Various ma- things made it be scheduled for an hour, and we did not prepare any guests, and we had planned to cancel it. A lot of people showed up. Of course. So, we, uh, we winged it, and it seemed to go over really, really, really well. Well, luckily, we put together a good panel. It was Uncle Yo, me... Uh, Emily, Emily, Conrad, and Scott Johnson. It was. And for contestants, we got a pretty good contestant from the audience. And we got Laura to be the ringer because Laura knows her anime. So I could count on Laura to give the funny anime answer. Yep. She also scored a whole bunch of points because <laughs> she, she knew what was going on. Did the contestants score any points at all? Never. Oh, so sad. It doesn't matter. I gave We gave the contestant the uh, prize, if you can call it that, anyway. Yeah. It was a most dangerous prize. I, you know, that's one thing. is be, After I saw that our schedule got changed, I thought going into Kineticon, we would at least, we would cancel two or three things. I thought we might have canceled the Galaxy Express. We canceled- I thought we would cancel the match game. I thought we would cancel the uh, Crab People. And the Saturday Night Hangout. We planned to cancel a lot of these things. Well, because- the Saturday Night Hangout was sort of canceled. Well, yeah, it was canceled in that we <laughs> just left. Yeah, we just went to bed. Yep. Yeah. Well, actually, no, we went and played games. Yeah, we did, but... Uh, but yeah, no, we didn't cancel anything. It, it just, it all, we ran all those events and they actually turned out a lot better than you would expect just throwing some shit together. Uncle, Uncle Yo did his uh, stand-up uh, Saturday night right after the match game. It Very was, popular, big It line. was super awesome. A lot of people looked like they had to be turned away because no one left the room from the match game. I know, right? Uh, yeah, but Saturday was just totally cool. Uh, what did I do on Saturday? I don't even remember. We did panels, we ate. We did the super art fight. Oh, right. That's right. While while everyone else is running panels, we did the super art fight, which you already talked about in Things of the Day. We went to the dealer's room. I went to the artist's alley. I looked around the gaming area. We went to eat lunch. We did all that sort of stuff. So, Oh, my God. Plus, Saturday night, like we, we gamed all night, hanging out with Luke Crane and Phil and the rest of the crew. Yeah, we played uh, Trans Europa, which is a game we'll talk about in the future. Maybe we get a chance to play it again. Nice, you know, simple to learn, difficult to master kind of game. Oh, we were also hanging out. I'll give a shout outs to people at the end of this episode, but we got to hang out with uh, the awesome uh, staffer, the panel staffer from our room, who I forget your name, dude, but you were totally awesome. Yep. There was also awesome dude who uh, asked me for a copy of Galaxy Express 3.9, the movie. I mailed him a DVD today that has that, the second movie, the Sanctuary manga, and also all of DMC. Oh, man. Which he wanted. So speaking, that guy's awesome. I sent him his DVD. Yeah. Speaking of which, DMC, crazy popular. But, you know, we showed it on Friday at, like, early in the morning. And we showed it again on Saturday, early in the morning. And the first, basically, we had to pull the, will anyone in this room be offended by this? And there was a, on Saturday, there was this kid clearly there for one day, like, with his mom. And he's kind of young. He was, like, middle school. And we're like, will anyone be offended by very, very strong language, blah, 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 blah. And the kid's looking real nervous. And he looks at his mom, and his mom's like, yeah, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) And then he's like, Uh... and they both laughed heartily at Detroit Metal City. Krauser. Krauser. It's the legend of Krauser. All right. (laughs) 
So uh, uh, let's see what else went down at the CT Con. The convention went down, but we didn't get to see any of that. Yeah. Uh, what I, of the convention did I see besides the super art fight? We'll get to that. I saw some cool stuff. But uh, Sunday, Sunday was the death day. Sunday, Sunday. We, I was, I was so like, I was just, I was done on Sunday. Really, I was actually kind of okay on Sunday because I got an okay sleep on Saturday. I got like five hours of sleep because we stayed up until like two. Then yeah, we that went was back an okay sleep. Yeah, but we had to be back at the con at eight for Good Morning Connecticut, and we had to check out of the hotel. Yeah, it was all right. Yeah, checking out of the hotel was a little bit rough, and then I left the pres. I bought a presentation clicker that was totally awesome and it totally sweet and worth every penny. I almost left it in the hotel room, but luckily I also forgot to leave my key in the hotel room, so I was able to go back up and get it. But the elevators, oh man. Oh, man. It sucked. I ended up actually getting off on, like, the ninth floor from the 19th floor and then taking the stairs from there. And then I met someone in the elevator who knew me, and, you know, we walked down the stairs. Uh-huh. And it was kind of crazy. we had something special scheduled on it. Well, we had a couple of things on Sunday. Sunday was the, for anyone who wants to know, you know, how do you pull off dealing with situations or on the fly coming up with, you know, managing a panel or entertaining a crowd? Sunday was the day because we pulled everything off without a hitch, but uh, good morning, Connecticut, whatever. Crab people. We scheduled this in the book because we had nothing. We had no idea what to put here, so we scheduled it, and we figured at some point during the con we would come up with an idea. Yeah, so we went in to the Crab People panel, and of course, no matter what, we were going to talk about what Crab People is. And we talked about the South Park episode of Crab and there People. there were a lot of people there. It was a scary number people. of people, right. So we described to them, you know, what Crab People is, you know, and how it's sort of a placeholder for when you don't know what else to put there. And sometimes, if you don't ever come up with a replacement, it's just Crab People. And that's why there's Crab People in South Park. And so we, whole thing. D- we do this for a couple minutes, and then... Sure enough, Cat Lowe, who already had a panel prepared, uh, No Means No, which she ran at Oticon, ran her panel, and everyone loved it. Yep, it was awesome. And, I, think, uh, I think what I want to do... It was a great filler. Anywhere we ever are in charge of panels, or in any capacity, I want to always schedule a crab paper on Sunday. Mm. Just always. I want it to be like this kind of semi-inside joke shtick, because cons have that stuff. There'll always be the crab people, and people will know that when you go to that panel, there are crab people. <laughs> Maybe, like, we should have, like, crazy surprises at the panel. Like, yeah, maybe, be the... Like, if we're head of panels at Kineticon, right, maybe crab people should be, like, one of the big guest panels. Like, secret XKCD panel. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, shit. Oh, by it... the way, Randall Monroe was at the convention. I didn't even see him or talk to him. I did see him at uh, Mocha, At though. one point, I'm in our room, and, you know, the room's kind of full, and I see this crazy line outside the, outside the door. And all every time is... there was a crazy line, it was for Randall Monroe. Every time. Both times. Two times. Because everything else that was a big line was either super art fight which we saw or for us <laughs> or something in our room like i gotta Uncle say Leo. one thing we couldn't have super art fight we would not have been able to see it except that we kind of know the people who do it and we know the artists and such so and you know as we're walking toward art fight the art fight people are like hey you guys geek nights you gotta go to art fight we're like we're on our way and they're like oh man cool okay never and mind. then we get to it and there's all these people waiting to go into super art fight but there's still a panel in there that's not over yet so we just walk in and sit in the front row for the panel that's not over yet. Well, well, well. <laughs> and we, then we that walk... panel leaves, and we're sitting in the front row for Super Art Fight. We walk up to the door, and one of the Super Art Fight guys goes, hey, it's you guys, and he kind of points us in. So we walked in to the other panel and just sat in the front row. Yeah, I just walked right in. I didn't even see that guy. Uh, that guy waved us in. I talked to him a little bit. Whatever. It's all good. Super Art Fight rocks the shizzy. Oh, my God. And I, I cannot say 100% because it's not my department, but... Super Art Fight is almost definitely going to be at Kineticon next year, probably in main events. I hope so, and I hope we can get Super Art Fight, you know, to all sorts of other conventions that we can influence. Oh, my God. And maybe even just, you know, like, just in New York, randomly. My goal is to get them at PAX East and to get Gabe to be a contestant. Fuck yes. That would be, like, the biggest fucking thing. Gabe versus Kurtz. PAX East. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, yeah. be, you know, it'd be awesome though if we could get like if we can get like uh, it would always it'd basically be like gay versus everyone, right? So that we get who, they who? can tag out. We should have like a all no, no, star it should cast. Just, no, he should just have to fight three people, right? And here's here's the three people I think Gabe should have to fight. You ready? All right, all right. Scott Kurtz, oh, Scott the Kurtz. PvP guy, because you know they're so you know enemies, right? He should have to fight uh, David Peterson because yep. he couldn't possibly win. <laughs> we got it. We have someone who can beat him, right? And the third person that he should have to fight is... You don't remember the guy's name. Are you thinking about who I'm thinking about? 
Uh, it's the guy that like Gabe like Gabe was inspired by Silver or something. The guy who did the Kim Possible, whatever. Oh, like because it's like that's like going against like you know that's like uh, having a duel with your sensei. Killed his sensei in a duel, and he never said why. Exactly. Yeah, I wish I could remember what that guy's name was. But those are the three people that should fight Gabe Gabe in the super art fight. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of having an all star cast that can tag team in and out. Yeah. Oh, one thing that was uh, you know the tag you know I was watching the tag battle. The tag battle actually. Was, didn't work out so well. I like the non-tag battles better. Well, you'd have to change up the rules of the tag battle. It, can't yeah, it, was, the it got thing. a little out of control, basically, and it lost sort of the structure that sort of kept it uh, kept it nice. Even though some funny, crazy things did happen, I think you know the tag battle and all those people getting involved. The result on the on the no you know, tag the battle wise, you realize has to be two v two, and there's rules about if you tag someone in, you can't tag back. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. But that's not how they did it. It was basically just got out of control, and there were just too many people doing arts and whatever. But it was cool. Uh, one thing, though, there was the dude from Columbia. Uh, what's his name? Cypher, right, I think was his name. That guy uh, was my Scott favorite my favorite non-Yuko. Yeah, I mean, Scott Johnson, our Scott Johnson, right, said that that guy from Columbia is usually on a podcast with the Extra Life Scott Johnson, right? So we got to get all three of them together. Yeah, so the best was it was uh, it was Cypher versus what, Garth Graham, I think is the guy's name. Oh, my God, when, when right? he drew so, that skull. So Cypher started drawing zombies, and Garth Graham started drawing gears and then garth goes over to put some gears on the zombies so he goes over and puts a zombie bite in the gear and that's when people were like "Woo! That here we gear go biter. super the, art fight for the win that gear biter was the second best thing that gear biting zombie man ah uh, it was pretty much the gear biter the bruce campbell in a cosby sweater macho man thing and uh steampunk pikachu I don't know, as as dapper and top hattish as steampunk Pikachu was. Steam Pokemon? The uh, horny unicorn behind Billy Mays. I didn't like the horny unicorn. I like the steam Pokemon. The horny unicorn got points when it became a clown. Yeah. I should go to the Super Art Fight website and put some stuff in there. Yeah. I just put in Messenger Z. Straight <laughs> I was up. Very, I, I saved the day twice. I'm so happy because Yuko did not know who Super Macho Man Randy Savage was. Uh, but I had the pre. I was like GIS, and I was and I was like tag oh, yeah. team. I held it up, and she's like, oh. to a slim gym, and she looks at it. And she's like, oh, that guy. And then it was game. Next art fight, dude didn't know who Abe Vigoda was. I pull up a picture. Uh, he looks at it for like two seconds, and he draws a perfect Abe Vigoda. Pretty good, Abe. It Vigoda. was crazy. Yeah, that's what you have when you have artist skills. Yeah, I mean, someone shows me a hello, shows me a, you know a, a picture of a programming language. I'll do a hello world. Yeah, Tycho. <laughs> I know you don't listen to our show, but remember when they did that comic way back about how like Photoshop heroes? Yeah, that is what Art Fight is. It is. It is Photoshop heroes. We should find some way to bring Super Art Fight online. Oh, uh, you could do that with some sort of real time Okaki, but it loses the magic. It does lose it a lot of magic. It loses the magic of when the referee threw the yellow card at Yuko when she accidentally switched hands for a second to color something during the left handed round. Yep. Uh, the yellow card. <laughs> anyway, enough about Super Art Fight, as awesome as it is. Um, after Crab People, Emily did Becoming an Animator, which I watched like 20 minutes of. I didn't watch any of it. Was it it is really cool because I didn't get to see a lot of the front row crew panels. To see, you know, we do like these panels on tech or anime, you know, things we really know a lot about. And we're really, we had this Japanese professor come up to us after all of our panels. And oh, yeah, what was her name? I forget her name, but I have her business card. We're going to be talking. I want to do stuff with her because she's cool. Yeah, she was like a professor at a college in Japan. And she was coming over to study, like, you know, fandom of anime and manga among the U.S. peoples. Like, she was seriously studying it. And she was asking us all these great questions and... It was, it was just totally awesome, and we definitely got to do a lot more stuff with her. Yep, but, like, she was amazed at how much we know about anime, which is sad in a way because we are rank amateurs compared to the majesty of Daryl Surratt. I know, right? And she was like, wow, you know more than Japanese people know about anime. Just <laughs> fucked up in a way. But, so, you know, all this professionalism, I lost my train of thought, but I'm getting it back very slow. So, seeing Emily do this panel on animation was like going to a lecture on animation because... She is an expert at animation in the way that we are experts at, like, computer stuff. Yep. And it was, like, the same, you know, professional slides, professional jargon and explanation. It was just great. And Katsu did uh, Ask the Kendo Master, you know, the Q&A for Kendo. Getting into it, we had Scott Johnson and I believe other people, I didn't see the panel, talk about, you know, actually 
what it takes to go from I go to anime cons to I run anime cons. Is that cons. what he talked about? I'm still yeah. not sure what he talked about. That's what he talked about because he went from going to anime cons to running anime cons, much like us. Uh huh. Moe Anthropomorphism Tan was very popular. I that saw was, part of that panel. There was Emily and Katsu talking about all that Moe Anthro Tan they, they stuff. They had some good Tans there. So, the Action Castle reprise, Jared was gone, and as a result... Yeah, see, there you go. We scheduled him for something that he didn't show up for. So. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And uh, character building, character burning workshop. Now... We had nothing planned for either of these, and we did not have Jared to run Action Castle. We cannot run Action Castle. I mean, my I did a daring dungeon, but I did it for people who had never played Action Castle, so they didn't realize how poor a facsimile it was. But now I've actually, you know, seeing Action Castle again and studying it, I think I can, you know, apparently they also have a jungle adventure. I can tell kind. you one thing about making an action castle. I can make it. I feel that I can do an action castle now because there was the acting component of it that I was not incorporating and such. Well, to memorizing, you have to memorize it. I'm going to memorize it no matter what. I'm going to make, and the thing is, action castle is a lot simpler than I remember it being. Yeah. My daring dungeon was really complicated, and I think that was part of the problem. I'm going to come up with a much simpler one, and uh, you'll, you'll see. I'm going to. It's going to be my own thing. I don't know if I'll do daring dungeon, though. I'm, I might make a space adventure i still want to make bastard castle and sinking ship no oh, sinking ship those are my two but the one thing i can say about making an action castle it takes a long time uh no so so a million people showed up to this and we had nothing yeah so we decided to try out something that we had talked about but we weren't sure if it was feasible. Like, we talk about this a lot, and we wanted to run it at a con, but we never worked out the logistics. We never figured out, like, we never did the analysis of, can this work on a stage? And I gave it a 50-50 shot if it was feasible at all. So we ran a Burning Wheel demo for the audience. We basically had two people who knew Burning Wheel and two people who had never played Burning Wheel in their lives, one of whom had never even heard of Burning Wheel. Yep, awesome staff guy, uh, Phil, me, yep. me and Rim. Now, and Alex was GM, and Alex did a real good job. Yep, Luke Crane would have done it, but he had to leave. He couldn't stick around for Sunday. Yeah, he so left Saturday night. So. We kind of just you know, tried running this for a crowd, and let me tell you, the crowd loved it. It'll take almost nothing to turn this into a real event. Yeah, I did a real good job, too. My. Well, well, to a degree. Scott had like all these plans to win as the elf, but... I was the rat, which was a big fucking mistake <laughs> for all you other people. Because as Luke Crane told me, the rat is the most difficult character in the sword to play. But there we're is kidding. A, I'm, I, the rat's the easiest as far as I'm concerned. There is a almost surefire way to win as the rat unless the other people are privy to the knowledge. So I basically got Scott, the elf, and the dwarf to kill each other. It was so crazy because I basically said I went all out, right? I was like, I just used everything in my power to fucking get that sword, right? First, I used my persona point to pay the rat, and it fucking worked. The big mistake. You fucked up right there because as soon as you pay me... I don't care one shit about you anymore. I already have the money in hand. Well, no, my mistake wasn't paying the rat. It was that when I, a afterwards, in my duel with the dwarf, I appealed to the rat. I should have appealed to the human, right? I could have done, I could have gotten the human to help me out and demolish the, uh, the dwarf even more. You know, and the fact that the dwarf did some damage to my body of argument meant I had to compromise. If I could have just demolished him completely like I was going to, thanks to his, you know, uh, failed in sight which gave me plus 11 d then uh you know it would have been a much better outcome because he wouldn't have been able to you know i, I would have been able to get the sword and as soon as i get the sword i just stab the human and get the fuck out yeah but no you got stabbed in the kidney and then but then oh an amazing god. roll of circles oh my god i think that there's something about the sword that if you try circles it just always works so you see, he circles up his bro his brother, the swordsman, and the dwarf and that guy stab each other, and then me and the human just take the sword and leave these pieces. I've got that fucking dwarf, that piece of <laughs> shit. You guys are laying there bleeding to death, just ah, uh, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Yeah, nah. but we pulled it off, and we now know it is perfectly feasible to run a live demo of the sword in front of a crowd. All we need are slides of character sheets and volleys to put up on the projectors and microphones 
Yeah, microphones. And some, either a, a webcam or something. I'd like to have a top-down view of the die rolls for the crowd. Yeah, that'd be good. Other than that, it's set. So we're going to run this at some bigger con in the future. Hopefully. Maybe PAX East. We'll see. Requires some logistics. Yeah, but if we have, like, Lucrane at PAX East, oh, we can do it. Yeah, definitely. So... After that was the character burning workshop, which they put a uh, character building workshop in the uh, top level schedule, but it was the real description in the rest of the schedule. I felt bad for these like eight cosplay people who came expecting something very different. <laughs> yeah, but actually, you know, it was sort of haphazard, but like as it went on, it actually started to work. I was, I was very surprised. This was another, we're not sure if this was really a feasible event. Let's try it. And we had Luke, or not Luke, we had uh, Pete and Wyatt. And I sat up there with them, and I think what made it, in my opinion, was me being awesome and being awesome. Uh huh. Because you see, I had the laptop, and I was losing my voice. You know, finally on Sunday, and the radio voice can only hold out for so long, yelling for like forty hours straight. So I put the laptop up on the projector, opened up like Abby Word, and as we, as a group, you know, with the audience, created this character. By the way, I'm going to post the character online when I get a chance. We made a really awesome character from nothing. Pretty good character. That's how life paths work. Like, by the end of this, everyone who wasn't interested in Burning Wheel was basically, like, they were going to go buy the books as soon as they got home. Mm. But we made this character with the it audience. Was actually, uh, Luke Crane told me there was, the thing is, there's some game sellers, you know, in the uh, Kineticon dealer's room. And, uh, you know, they have indie RPGs, some of them, quite a few of them, in fact. One guy who had burning wheels sold all his copies, went to get more for Saturday, and then went to get more for Sunday. You know, it's like, you know, he sold them all every day. Yeah. So. I'm very happy about that. That's good. But what I did is I did a, a style of humor that I've never really done at conventions. I'm shooting my own horn a little bit here, but I think it's justified because I had people laughing their asses off. While Pete and Wyatt are trying to serious businessly kind of run this character burning workshop and get the crowd into it, all I did was type stuff on the on the screen while they talked. And let me tell you, it is very easy to get people to laugh by typing the word prostitute periodically throughout a panel. Maybe we should do some sort of high concept panel where it's two screens, two projectors, two laptops, and we're just typing. Or, or maybe we just no. bring up a Google Wave and we type. I, I like the idea of some sort of iron, some sort of panel where you have people who have to do a panel kind of on the fly, but in the meantime, there is running commentary on two projectors that is just text in a file from like me and Scott. <laughs> Statler and Waldorf. Something like that. Yeah. But anyway, we also, it worked really well. You know, we got the crowd into it. And we had them kind of think about a character. Just by following the rules of Burning Wheel, we made this badass character in about an hour. Yep. All right. So other notable things from Kineticon. There were these two people who really wanted to play Burning Wheel real bad. And a lot of people did get to play Burning Wheel. I think he said he ran like five swords, if not more. You know, so and that was just Luke, not counting Alex. Yeah, Alex ran some, and then they gave Burning Wheel stickers to everyone who played, and I saw a lot of stickers around, so a lot of people got to play. That's was, a brilliant idea, because one, everyone We're doing that, we gotta get you guys stickers before the next, before PAX. This is so brilliant, and conventions need to do this in a big way, but we are going to capitalize on it first. Get a gigantic sticker. Well, didn't Rose say she was making you guys pins or something? Oh my god. Uh, yes, yes. But what Luke would do is, if you played in a demo of Burning Wheel... You got a burning wheel sticker, and you stuck it on your badge. Now think about what this does. One, it prevents multiple people from getting multiple demos of different DMs and taking up time. Two, it reminds people, oh yeah, burning wheel and indie role-playing games, and then they'll go buy it when they get home. Three, you're walking around the con, and people say, hey, what's that sticker? And one thing I found is that, much like with Princess Tutu... Much like the Pokemon Stamp Rally. Yeah, but also Princess Tutu. When we get people excited about something... If someone else asks them about that thing, the excitedness transfers over. Hey, man, what's that sticker? Oh, uh, you don't know about Burning Wheel? Ah! That's the fucking Burning Wheel, bitch. Hey, Gotta this play. Is All right. But um, three, three things. What it does is if I have the sticker and I see someone else with the sticker. You want to get the sticker? No. No, I have the sticker. He has the sticker. We don't know each other. We're just at this con. Oh, oh that, yeah. Suddenly, no. two people who are into indie role-playing games find each other and become friends. Yep. Yep, it's all good. So, uh, there were these two people, though, who wanted to play, and, like, 
uh, you know, usually when this sort of happens at conventions, you know, you see someone and you like, you want to do something, but you can't schedule it. Right. So it's like, they really wanted to play. So I promised them. All right. We'll play Sunday. I swear. Right. So, you know, Luke Crane had already left by the time and, you know, such and such. And I was like, we're going to do it. I, I'm not going to let you leave without playing. And we tried real hard and like, they just disappeared and we didn't see them again, even though we like waited for them and tried to find we tried, them. I, and- like, I tweeted just in case I tried to get them to come if they were still around to Action Castle because we were going to run. Now, I think Wheel. they left at noonish or something. Yeah. So, just, so they, I, they just disappeared and we couldn't make it happen, even though we tried real hard. So email us. You know, normally, it's like I would, you know, blame myself because I, I promised that I, I was trying to make it happen for those people. But you know what? They disappeared. I waited by the RPG room. They didn't show up. So you know what? I'm going to blame them. It's tough. Uh, email us. and I'm sure we'll see you. We'll at see con. you at another convention. And if I do see you at another convention, I'll pretty much just drop, you know, and it, for, if nothing else, I'll just drop everything immediately, unless it's I'm on a panel, and I will personally run it for you if I have to, because you know that's how it goes. So we put a panel feedback session in, and because our schedule was shifted a little bit by it the con, it conflicted with the real feedback session, which which is not intentional. But that was fine. A lot of people came to the panel feedback session, gave a lot of feedback, and. It was the we first didn't have time, to listen to any nasty masquerade feedbacks. It is the first time I have been able to be on the feedback session as opposed to being at the feedback session. I think I'm real good at being on the feedback panel. I think so, too. And you know what? It was real fun, but at the same time, you know that vibe at Oticon? Like, there's this certain vibe at the feedback session of the people on stage. And I suddenly had that vibe in me. Like, it was weird how suddenly it Really? Because like- I sort of noticed a different vibe, right? Because it was like, I was thinking about the Oticon vibe, you know, the way that people were up on the feedback panel being like, Ugh. but I was just like, you know, shooting the shit, being totally honest with people. I was like, a guy was like, hey, how come, you know, there's not more 18 plus stuff? I'm like, first, regardless of legalities, right? We don't want the newspaper to say tomorrow, you know, Kineticon showing porn to kids, right? So I was just, you know, and I, I felt it was, I was being a lot more, uh, open well, with the people and I, you know, they are less uh, talking down to them. One thing that worked really well was we did the thing that we tell Oticon to do. They never do is we had the projector showing all the feedback that had already been given. And before we let people give feedback, we told them about the things we already knew about. Like every time someone gave feedback about something, Rim typed it into the, to the word processor and that was up on the projector. So everyone could see everything that had been talked about. And when we were done, we had a document that contained all the feedback. How convenient. So obvious, yet no one does it except us. Yep, but uh, after that, you know, everything went smooth. We uh, packed up all our stuff. We had somehow survived the whole apocalypse. We went out and got an awesome dinner in, uh, you know, the town next door where there's actually food. Yeah, people don't understand Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut is the capital of Connecticut, right? It has East Hartford, which is the ghetto, and it has West Hartford, which is basically, uh, and also, well, the city proper, right, downtown Hartford, is all these big office buildings, but there's nothing under, like in New York City, the bottom of an office building has stuff, right? It's like if you walk down the street, there'll be clothing stores and delis and all sorts of stuff, right? If you walk down the street in Hartford, it's just concrete and the entrance to the big office building and concrete and the entrance to an office building and that's it. It's just office buildings and government buildings. There's no stuff on the street. I mean, even the Empire State Building has like, you know, freaking comic book stores in it and shit and restaurants and all who knows what else, right? But, you know, the... uh, In Hartford, nothing. So the way Hartford works is you have all these office buildings that all these people work in, and all those people live either in East Hartford, in the ghetto, or in West Hartford, the rich-ass suburbs. So, of course, on our way out of Kineticon, right, we go to West Hartford, where all the rich people live, where all the nice restaurants are to get dinner, because there's nowhere to eat in Hartford, because all the office buildings go all the way to the ground, and there's nothing in them. So uh, lots of fancy restaurants going over there, but the Maggie Moo's was closed and we were not able to get cake ice cream. Uh, luckily, cake ice cream is now in the grocery store. Actually, I bought banana split ice cream. I'm going to eat when the show that. is over. I'm going to eat some. But all things considered, we basically packed panels nonstop into panel five for the entirety of Kineticon without issue. Yep. I think, though, next year at Kineticon, I think we should uh, have, you know, maybe like one or two fewer panel rooms uh, bigger, maybe, yeah, maybe we'll just combine two of the small ones into one more big one. You know, that way we'll have, what do they have? Five rooms, I think six rooms. 
There were five panel rooms and three workshop rooms. I think what I want. I'm thinking four I, no, panel rooms and two workshop I rooms. I want one big panel room, four smaller panel rooms, I mean, and then two workshops. I'm thinking of maybe a big, a medium, and two smalls. We might not be able to do that. It depends on the. It does. It, we got to look at the layout of the of the building. But you know, yes, four or five instead of six, maybe, and then uh, two workshops instead of three. You know, I think I think it'll work out. But suffice it to say, one, I got to give huge props and thanks to everyone in the front row crew who gave panels, and everyone of any, everyone related to the front row crew who gave panels. We really couldn't have done this without you guys. Yeah, we thank the Luke Cranes and the Jareds yep. and the Kineticon people. And Emily and Luke and Alex and Pete and White and Scott and Lara and all the people on the crew, Uncle Yo, everyone who did all those panels. And the staff guy and, and the tech guy and uh, who helped us out in the room. Yeah, the Kineticon staff were pretty much pretty just awesome and badass the whole time. Yep, Nuri, even though she was mostly in the deals room. Yep. We had a, we met a whole bunch of cool listeners. Like your Lord Yupa was hanging out in the room. Yeah, and, all the uh, listeners who came and made the room look more full. Uh, I forget a lot of your names, which is why I didn't say any more names. The strange people who asked us to sign things. You were very strange. I think it's cool. People seem to like the posters. Yeah, uh, I guess that's about it. Kineticon, it's the everything con. Next year, we're in charge. We're gonna try to make awesome happen. We, you know, what we have to do is we have to basically get as much. Uh, money as we can to basically bring people in. That way we could, you know, bring... Well, pretty much my plan for Kineticon next year, panels and workshops-wise. Because we could bring in, like, the AWO crew, right? And then maybe we could bring in, like, you know, Ninja Consultants or something. We could do mad panels, like a ton. I basically want to split panel programming three ways. One-third anime and comics, you know, including web comics. Uh, this is, and also and the manga. This is not counting webcomic and guest panels. That's kind of a separate... One-third gaming, video gaming, tabletop, board game, role-playing game. And one-third just cool, geeky stuff. Like, I've got someone lined up who might be able to do a really cool interactive robotics workshop. Very nice. Uh, we've got someone who could probably do some really cool parkour workshops. A parkour workshop? Yeah. You can't do that in the con, really. Well, you could do they a... Did in, the da in the ballroom? You can do a parkour workshop of demonstration that's mostly a panel. Ah. And then just let people hurt sort themselves. Sort of like the kendo panel? Yeah, outside of the convention center, outside of Kineticon, with no relation to Kineticon whatsoever. Yeah. That's where they hurt themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're going to schedule, like, we should schedule all sorts of, like, activities like that in the ballroom. And then, you know, maybe we could have, like, you know, one less panel room, that you know, a bigger panel room instead. That well, way. like, belly dancing needs to be in the ballroom where there's exactly. stuff for it. And the there was, there were things scheduled in the ballroom, like Duck Duck Goose. Yep, but that basically. <laughs> I don't know why they had that there, but. We, know. yes, we're We could aware. schedule a kendo over there. We're going to schedule as much cool stuff as we can over there. And I know we can get away with a lot of this because people can already get away with, like, the Bafa tournament. Yep. So we. As they can as do the Bafa tournament. We can do Kendo in the ballroom. We're going to sign whatever forms we need to sign to make all this awesome stuff happen, and Kineticon is going to be amazing next year. Yeah, that's something that Otakon doesn't do, right? Otakon is the rave, but basically during the day before the rave happens, like, that is basically autograph lineup area, right? They could run actual, like, panels there like you know like any demonstration that requires anything physical you know like a belly dancing or a para para teaching or a kendo or a something something and they or, don't or they could just do like packs and have the one panel room that's kind of open and just have open panels in there yep that's cool all right we've gone on long enough and we talked mostly about ourselves but that's all we did at Kineticon. If you want a review of Kineticon, I'm sure there might have been someone else there who's going to podcast. I'm basically just, from now on, other convention reviews will be more like traditional ones, but from this day forth, Kineticon con reviews are going to be us talking about ourselves and about Kineticon and about the back end. That's it. We're, we're never going to do anything at Kineticon ever again, except run, like, panels and programming and all that business. Yep. So you ha there you have it. I'm going to go eat you, some ice cream. If you think you have what it takes to be a panelist at Kineticon, because let me tell you, the bar is being raised. Yeah, you got I mean, you know, I can understand. You know, there's some kids out there. You know, they're inspired by us to run some panels, right? But listen, you have to be good, right, to run a panel, right? Like, prove if, you gotta, if we don't know who you are and you don't have a panel resume already, you're going to have to prove to us somehow that you can be you know, run a good panel panel now point several people have done this in the past so it's not like we're asking too much just basically be awesome yes yeah, send us a I recording of you know doing a panel like just turn your webcam on record yourself giving the panel you know put it on youtube i don't i'm not gonna watch the whole thing but i just need to watch like a few minutes i'm like aha this person knows how to present all right 
you know, if it, or show me your panel resume. Show me, look, I've done panels at my middle of nowhere con. Oh, also, uh, speaking of middle of nowhere con, one of our listeners from Kansas was there. He came all that way, even though I was like, whoa, dude, why'd you come all this way for little old Kineticon? But he looked like he had a good time, and he saved my ass with an iPod charging cable. So mad uh, props Oh, that guy, that guy was pretty cool. Yeah, that guy's awesome. Uh, apparently Trogdor was there, but he didn't go to, he didn't speak off at Pete's, Pete's uh, metal panel. Uh-huh. By the way, Pete's metal panel was awesome. The only thing it lacked was that Pete does not know how to make a playlist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pete, also, uh, I he's, gotta, he needs, needs a little polish. His content is all right. Yeah, the thing is, Pete's metal panel, Pete got punked at one point by none other than Luke Crane. I want to bring this up. Uh, Pete, Luke Crane, it, you know, Pete's metal, Luke Crane is more metal. I'm telling you. Luke Crane you. is pretty fucking metal. He's but really metal. Luke Crane, you know, Pete had this amazing chart that was very like it was actually but it well was done. actually like it wasn't just like a joke it was actually a legitimate chart that he actually started explaining i was like really you're serious it's not just like well, putting up there for a joke it was on the surface a joke but in reality not but he made the mistake of not considering anthrax when he showed the hip-hop influence turning into anthrax turning into shitty new metal let's rewatch and bastard and do a show on oh it. my god bastard is like the Metallica. best <laughs> <laughs> but Luke Crane raises his hand very politely and points out, I'll paraphrase here, Pete, fuck you, Anthrax is awesome. I'm and all Pete, could, all Pete could say was, you know what? I fucked up. You're right. <laughs> Anthrax is awesome. Okay. <laughs> he needs like, you know, shitty new metal in the corner of the slide. And then in parentheses, accept Anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> then we're cool. All right, so I think we're uh, we're done with the show. We're done. We out. There may or may not be shows next week. We'll tell you why later. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via audio. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.